Hello, I'm Ann Rowley, one of the co-chairs of the 11th International Kawasaki Disease Symposium, here with Brian McCrindle, the other co-chair. Today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Michael Portman from Seattle Children's Research Institute and Dr. Shrestha from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And we're going to be talking about the Immunology of Kawasaki Disease Symposium that we're having at lunchtime today. So, Michael, maybe you can start off uh, telling us a little bit about the session. Okay. To start with, I'd like to say that uh, I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Seattle Children's. And um, Sadeep is from University of Alabama. He's my colleague. And we are uh, a pair. And we work very closely. And uh, I do the clinical portions and collect DNA for our studies. And Sadeep basically does the analysis of the DNA sequences. So what we're going to talk about today is the role of FC gamma receptors in Kawasaki disease. And in the simplest form, FC gamma receptors are immune receptors, and they appear on most uh, inflammatory cells and affect reaction of those inflammatory cells to the tissues during inflammation. Um, do you want to add anything to that little brief synopsis? Uh, the, the part that I'm going to talk about is the immunogenetics rather than the immunology. Um, because there's so much overlap with Kawasaki disease and other uh, autoimmune disease. Um, so from that angle, we're trying to say, although the etiology of Kawasaki is not known, maybe there are immune-related genes that might be playing a role in Kawasaki disease. So basically what we're doing, it's, it's uh, in a way population-based research. And at Seattle Children's, we have, uh, with several other hospitals, a consortium, and we have collected samples of DNA from patients as well as their parents because one of the genetic tools that we use is called the transmission disequilibrium test. So we actually look at transmission of different alleles and different genes from the parents to the children. And that's one of the basic techniques that we do. Well, um, other studies use more of a case control analysis. Yeah, and um, a lot of GWAS studies have been done with Kawasaki disease, that genome-wide association study of you know, different variants all over the genome. Uh, what we've also tried to do slightly different is you know, focus on uh, kind of GWAS, but more on um, immune-related genes. Uh, there is a specific uh, chip called immunochip um, that has about you know close to 200 different immune-related genes, and um, the the SNPs or the variants are fine map. Fine map meaning you know they have a detailed uh, variants that have been actually associated in auto other autoimmune disease. So in that sense, it's a very unique way of looking at immune-related genes in in the context of Kawasaki disease. So what do you think of as the kind of long-term implications of your work? Where would you like to, to see it go in the long term? In the long term, we would like to develop new therapies and perhaps personally directed therapies so that we can identify somebody's genotype and at that point early on in their disease determine perhaps whether they would respond to therapy or whether they would need a different sort of therapy, perhaps a novel therapy, or we can actually build therapy by uh, the studies that we're doing. I, I would say our approach is a little bit different because the GWAS, which is of course genome-wide association studies, um, it's nice and you can pick up some novel markers, but in our case uh, we do primarily hypothesis-driven research where we use a scientific basis and then we go looking at a specific gene or a specific family of genes to see if they are altered uh, in Kawasaki disease, to see if they affect susceptibility, and to see if uh, they affect treatment response to IVIG, which is a primary therapy in Kawasaki disease. Yeah, the, the goal, I think, would be, you know, obviously to get biomarkers or for diagnostic purpose. If these genetics will indicate towards that. Of course, this is not going to be the biomarkers, but at least hope that it will indicate towards it. Uh, the second one is also to understand the mechanism of Kawasaki, you know, how it occurs and how IVIG works, uh, because, you know, IVIG is great, it works fantastic, but still I think the mechanism is not known. 
So hopefully if we focus on immune-related genes, maybe that will give us some indications as to how, the, how it's working. Mm -hmm. So if you were to have a, a, a take-home message for the audience after your lunch symposium, what would it be the main points you'd like people to walk away with? Well, one of the points that I'd like to make is that when we do these genetic analyses and we find out about the pathogenesis of the disease, it can lead us into maybe totally new areas. One issue that we found is that the FC gamma receptors are very, very important. And in, we started looking at environmental factors that could perhaps affect the, the balance which is needed to between act, these activating and inhibiting receptors. And one of the environmental factors that we honed in on were isoflavones, which are prevalent in soy. And um, it came to all these genetic studies we've done, we've not really found a single genetic factor or single gene that really explains the ethnic based differences in incidence. So it's huge. The Asian population has almost 10 times the incidence of Kawasaki disease than Caucasian populations. And we really couldn't understand that. We haven't been totally able to explain that by genetics. So could it be environmental? Well, these isoflavones, particularly one called genistein, which we all eat in soy, uh, and it's very prevalent in our diet, is a primary inhibitor of the action of the FC gamma receptors. So we started to explore that area. And at first, we looked at uh, the population data that was available, particularly in Hawaii, where we have Japanese populations living uh, uh, right next to native Hawaiian populations and, and with Caucasian populations. And when we looked at that data, it should, looked like there was actually a relationship to soy intake and Kawasaki disease in the Hawaiian population. So it sounds like your work may be able to have an interplay between genetics, immunology, causative triggers, and bring some of these things together, which, uh, which is a, a nice way to approach uh, the continuing problem of Kawasaki disease. Yes. And we believe we might be able to explain the difference in incidence by something as simple as what's in your diet and what these little little babies and small children eat in these different countries and different ethnic groups. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to the lunch symposium today to hear more about this. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.